thanks for joining us, Paul. How are you? Um, very well. Nice to see you again. Yeah, same here, same here. Bill, I've got a few questions for you. Shall we kick off? Uh, yes, please go right ahead and I'll do my best to answer them. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So, Bill, the first one is just about, I know you conducted a whole cell review and you looked at a new idea cycle during the quarter as well. Can you please start by talking us through some of the positions that you sold during the quarter? Uh, yes. So, um, we've sold a, a range of stocks. Most of them... Um, are for basically the investment cases we build up, which uh, are a function of whether they're the surprise that we're looking for in the market in terms of um, analysts pushing up their earnings forecasts, whether they're being uh, driven by um, whatever factor that's driving them, whether it's more to do with the, uh, the persistency of the business and delivering surprises for longer than people expect, or whether because the business has got into some sort of trouble and management of been realistic about the problems and faced up to them and sort of retrench the business and the market is skeptical and uh, the market and we believe that there are going to be surprises that will be coming uh, uh, forwards over the next six to 12 months. So those are the key two sort of paths we end up finding surprises. Um, so uh, basically when we've been going through the stocks in the last review uh, that we have about a dozen maybe 15 stocks that for various reasons uh, we did not think would keep surprising um, and so we uh, did our review and said goodbye to them um, so would it be helpful if i just went through one or two names yeah sure sure please go ahead um so uh, enphase energy um which is a company uh, american company makes uh, solar energy equipment uh, just basically uh, it looks like it's getting more competitive and the earnings are starting to flatten out and to slip. And so our view is that they will start to disappoint over the next few months. Um, there's a range of banks, um, mostly out in the States, uh, East West Bank Corp, uh, Cullen Frost Bankers, First Financial Bank shares, where if like the very early stage, a year or two ago, when interest rates started going up, it benefited their earnings profile and profits were surprisingly strong. Uh, but it now appears that um, because inflation is sort of sticky and persistently high, that uh, the banks are no longer to able to uh, increase their net interest margins. So they are basically slightly running into uh, into the quicksand in terms of their earnings. So life looks generally a bit more difficult for them. And so we've said goodbye to those those banks. Um, there are a number of other utility companies, which a um, number of utilities companies we say goodbye to. Our, our overall sense from reading what management are saying um, is that uh, it's becoming more problematic the increasing need to put in more cost around all sorts of utility infrastructure um, and to make a return on that as you know you need regulation which is constructive to allow you to make a return on that increased investment and our sense is that um, regulators are dragging their heels over this and so utilities are increasingly caught in a trap of having to put uh, increasingly larger amounts of investment into their businesses to improve the infrastructure they're in charge of and not being allowed to make a, a, a reasonable return on that increased investment. So they're slightly caught betwixt and between the costs are going up and returns are not following in the proportion they might like. And so you're starting to see pressure on the profit line. Um, and our sense is that most analysts are keeping their fingers crossed um, that they will be OK. Um, and our, our, our belief is that over the next year, which is what our focus of those earnings will gently start drifting down again. Um, and there are a number of companies in that area, um, RWE, the German um, solar, uh, so the renewables business, for instance, um, and um, a Amaran, the American utility business. So there are a number of utilities that we think are starting to struggle. Um, and we suspect that could be a trend that lasts really quite a long time. Um, one or two other stocks, which are more stock specific in nature, uh, British American Tobacco, uh, they're just persistent downgrades. Um, when we bought it a year or so ago, it looked um, cheap. The business looked like it was starting to get to grips with, you know, the relentless loss of its core cigarette business, tobacco business, and that the world of alternative products, um, including vapes and whatever, was starting to gain traction. But the evidence is that there's now significant pressure on that market as well, both from regulators and for other sort of issues. Um, uh, and so it starting to look like it's got more structural problems than we thought uh, so we've said goodbye to that 
Um, then there's, um, and say, a Freeport McMoran, a completely different business, which is the um, the the uh, the commodity business, which has a range of commodities. It, it Canadian business, which is uh, has a significant amount of copper in what it does. And our concern slightly with the copper cycle within the broader commodity range is that there's a lot of hope from individual companies around copper and the, the path around energy transition. And so our sense is that a lot of management are being slightly unrealistic about, if you like, the capital cycle within the copper franchise within commodities more generally. Um, and so our concern there is that, the, if you like, the capital uh, discipline within that industry, and you can see it with the behavior we think with Freeport, Montmoran, is is not great. And that will slowly put pressure on uh, their profits going forwards. And you, in, particularly in contrast to, to some of the other commodity companies, uh, where there's, we would argue, much greater capital discipline and a much greater emphasis on generating cash and returning that to um, shareholders. Um, then uh, another completely different business, um, C Limited, uh, which is the um, IT services business based out in Southeast Asia. Um, it looks like there's evidence of crap, cap, capital crowding in that part of the world. Uh, there's quite a lot of competition from uh, China. And so our sense, again, that there's too much trapped capital, which has sort of rushed in post COVID um, and will now not make the returns that most people were looking for. Um, so, um, and then another completely different company, BJ's, a wholesale um, club in, in the States, which is basically a large discount store. Uh, it looks like there's um, just sort of growth strain. They'd be quite ambitious in what they've done in the last few years, and they're struggling to sort of meet their plans. So we think they will probably start to disappoint. Analysts who are quite positive will start to be sort of less enamored with it, and there's risks that they disappoint and the share price gets dragged down. So um, you can see, I've, I've gone through it fairly quickly, but you can see there's really quite a wide range of stocks across, across a wide range of sectors. Um, and as you know, this is the way the reviews tend to take place. We look at each stock individually and we review what's been going on in the context of the, um, the investment case we've built up. Uh, and if we believe that investment case, which is driving the case for positive surprise over the next six months, um, has broken down, um, we will almost certainly sell it. If the share price has been particularly weak, we might wait a month or two. But, but the this, but this fundamental argument for the stock has broken down that puts it on a path to either immediate sale or a sale and fairly soon in the future. Um, so it's quite a wide mix of stocks. Um, so if, if you, if in terms of any th thematic question, I would say there's no obvious theme there at all. It's quite, it's quite a wide range of reasons across, across a wide range of sectors in various markets around the world. Thanks, Paul. That actually makes quite a lot of sense. Um, maybe just turning to the purchases now. So did you make any interesting purchases over the quarter, can you please share a bit about those? Uh, yes, the um, again the purchases are sort of fairly um, random in the sense of you can't really pick up any particular theme um, in terms of uh, any particular geographical region or whatever. But um, if you think of the the two key drivers of finding surprise, one is this you know companies that have got into trouble, accepted they've got a problem, restructured in some way, and the market's fairly skeptical. Um, and the company starts to deliver in a way that wasn't expected, which then brings the analysts and in turn the investors around to be more positive. So that path to surprise from having uh, got into trouble, which was we think of more of as an, what we call an investor buyer stock. Um, again, sort of range of different stocks there. I'll just give you two or three. Um, one would be, um, well, I'll give you a few there. So something like General Electric, the big uh, US business that was, as for those with long memories, was extremely successful in the 80s and the 90s and grew and grew and grew. But um, and then I think lost its way, just became too big, too much of a chaotic conglomerate. And it spent on many, many years trying to sort of restructure, sort itself out and try and work out really what it wants to be. And they've been doing that for many years and there've been many disappointments along the way. Um, the way we look at the company, um, it would seem to us that the key inflection point is um, the, the quite radical for them decision in um, late 2021 to uh, completely unwind itself by divesting non-core assets um, and becoming a pure play engine maker 
uh, for aerospace and defense. So they've completely radically changed the business, gone back to, if you like, the, the origins of what they were good at. Um, and that we think makes it a much better, cleaner business with much better management behavior. Um, analysts generally are still skeptical about whether that will be a successful strategy, um, but partly because people also worry about how long the, 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 like the post-COVID recovery in aerospace and the civil aero markets can carry on. But from our point of view, it looks like there's been significant trauma in the business. Management have finally accepted they've got a problem. They have finally done something about it. They've, they've focused on what they are good at. And now earnings are going up, profits are being revised up, but analysts and investors are still relatively suspicious about their prospects. So that is a setup that looks perfect to us for a company that's been through some radical change and is now on the path to what we call analyst bias, but in recovery. So all the conditions suggest to us that those forecasts, the profit forecasts, will be going up in the next in the next year or two. Um, a completely different sort of business would be, if you look at some of these, um, if you go to Japan now, they have a number of large um, trading house conglomerates, which for many, many years, many decades actually, have been running us, uh, I don't want to be sort of too unkind, but in a fairly sort of chaotic way, they've been, uh, they've grown and been unfocused and they've, incre they've over the years become really quite dependent on um, the role of commodities in the way that um, the Japanese supply chain and global supply, supply chain works. You know, uh, Japan has a need to bring in commodities. And so it's become a, a significant part of what they've done. But it's, as those businesses have been allowed to grow, they've become slightly chaotic in the way they've been managed. There's been a lot, not great focus on profitability. Uh, but what has happened with a number of these companies in the last few years is that management have finally focused on, if you like, tightening the businesses, getting rid of some non-core assets and focusing on profitability in a way that they've um, never done before. So they've divested non-core assets, uh, they've improved capital efficiency, and a, 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 a slow moving focus on shareholder returns has improved, if you like, the core drivers of the business as, as we might look at it. And profits are now starting to go up fairly steadily. I mean, the share price has done quite well for the last two or three years, um, but the, the changes that have gone on, uh, I, we think are very significant given how long these companies have been run in a much more sort of um, general conglomerate kind of way where there's been no particular focus on capital efficiency and certainly not on shareholders. Um, so those are two companies, Mitsubishi and Mitsui, which, um, if you like, have been through, I would say, slow motion change over a number of years um, and are now in a position where that greater focus suggests that they tick the box for us of being, again, the analyst bias um, recovery kind of stock where we believe earnings will keep going up over the next six to 12 months and analysts are still suspicious about how long that will last for. So they're obviously two completely different companies uh, from General Electric. Um, if I move back to the States, um, going into, again, a sort of different area, which is to do with e-commerce, um, and you'll be very familiar with this, through the, for the period of 2020, 2021, with the COVID and the pandemics, so there was a huge boom in the role of e-commerce in all of our lives. There was a huge amount of investment put in um, from a number of companies. And post COVID, basically the demand that people were expecting, you know, two or three years ago just hasn't kept going, which is no great surprise as the real world's return to normality. But a number of companies have found themselves having to think quite hard about the investment they put into their businesses and whether they're going to make a return on it. And it's um, a range of companies, some of them smaller, some of them very big. So um, a company that you may have heard of called Shopify, um, which is uh, basically a, uh, a software business which helps medium and small merchants uh, facilitate their e-commerce business. They they got overexcited. They put in too much investment. They tried to compete with people like Amazon on the logistics, but it's been a real problem for them. It just hasn't been profitable. It's actually caused them to make to lose money on all of the investments. So they've they've again they've restructured the business. They, they they've accepted they need to rein in their ambition. In fact, in Shopify's case, they've they've got rid of their logistics business, in fact, doing a deal with Amazon. And so they've gone back to the core of what they were good at. So you've now got a business which looks like it's been through some quite significant change. Management are focusing on the core business and the profits are starting to pick up again now that they're doing what they're good at. Um, and so, again, it's a business that's been through quite a lot of trauma, but now looks like an interesting business, which is starting to grow quite significantly um, again. 
Um, and so that, again, looks to us like a, just an interesting business driven by growth being faster than expected. And interestingly, I mentioned Amazon taking over their logis logistics business. Amazon is another company which we uh, have rebought, having been out of it for a while, because they suffered a similar sort of flight path into COVID, through COVID and out of COVID with putting in an awful lot of investment in 2020, 21, as they believe the world would radically change very quickly forever. As we know, the world is changing, but it, the, the pace of it has slowed down. So they have accepted that they need to rein back the investment in the business. Um, they've been more realistic about the growth they're trying to achieve. Um, the share price has not done well in the last two to three years as everyone has readjusted to what the new normal might be for a company like that. But in our view, looking at the company, the more realistic attitude of management, uh, the reining back of their ambition in terms of the profits they want to achieve. Um, actually, their cloud business, AWS, also has been through a sort of up and down period. Um, but around the edges, the, you know, the, the, the slow but inevitable rise of the world of AI and the need for huge computational infrastructure, which people like Amazon through their AWS business provides, um, it looks now like the conditions are much easier for Amazon to grow over the next two to three years. Um, and analysts generally still remain fairly skeptical about their short to medium term prospects. So again, it looks like a business that's been through quite a lot of trauma. Um, expectations have come back down. Management have done something sensible and earnings and profits are now starting to go back up again. So again, from our investment case, it looks like a stock which will keep surprising now um, for the, the next six to 12 months driven by the growth that we see back in the business. And there is still sufficient skepticism from the analyst community to suggest it's not a bad time to be buying that stock. Um, so again, we've got a smallish and a biggish company in that area. Um, finally, keeping half an eye on the time, um, we have one or two different stocks which are more of the predictable, slow moving growth stocks, uh, which also for us uh, are stocks we like to try and find because we think people tend to underestimate the the, the power of surprising slowly but surely over over multi-year periods. Um, and so we've got three um, uh, completely different businesses, all based out in the States, actually, which we bought in the last review. I'll go through them relatively quickly. Uh, we've got Booz, as, Booz Allen Hamilton, um, which is a, a consultant to the US government. Um, so basically it benefits from very long-term contracts. They tend to be inflation-proof. Um, compared to many of their competitors, they, they, they over many decades have moved into slightly higher growth areas before their competitors like cybersecurity. So they haven't had to resort to making many acquisitions. Um, it's not in one sense the most exciting business in the world, but it generally slowly but steadily grows on the back of the US government's need to outsource more of what it does like cybersecurity um, to people who are able to uh, do it well and control the costs. It's not a complicated argument, but there's almost never ending demand for what they do. Um, and so they just look like a good, well-managed business and they're very conservative and realistic about how they go about the business. A uh, completely different business in the States is Sintas, is a US supplier of corporate uniforms, which has diversified in, in recent years into um, other areas, um, nothing particularly glamorous, but sort of hygiene, health, safety, um, they now have over a million customers. It's a, just, that's a, it's a big business with a lot of people who use them. And they have a competitive advantage because they have this critical mass, which means if you're a company trying to outsource some of these slightly boring things you need to do in the business, um, whether it's your corporate uniforms or cleaning you know, the hygiene around the office, um, you can go to someone who is very big, very efficient, has a proven track record and is relatively cost effective. And so they tend to be gaining business because they've got this critical mass and they're very, very focused on what they do. They don't want to do anything else. They just relentlessly grind on doing what they do. So they have that sort of rather boring, but very attractive, predictable growth pattern that we look for. Um, and then maybe the last one very quickly, um, O'Reilly uh, Automotive, which is um, an auto parts business. Um, again, I think we're running out of time, so I'll be very quick, but they have sort of similar characteristics of long-term growth, which in part is driven by the increasing complication of the cars we all drive with much more electronics. And so if you like the slow moving demand for an expert to help you with mending your car, keeping it on the road, doing all the DIY that bamboozles us when we sit in a car and nothing works because the electronic something doesn't switch on. Um, they are again, a very conservative business, which are very focused on what they do. And so if I look across the, the, the 
the uh, the purchases were made over the quarter. Um, there were one or two others, but they were the main ones. It's quite a range of stocks. So we, some of them are those predictable growth stocks that we think will keep predict keep growing in that slightly boring but very appealing way that we look for. Uh, the one or two are, uh, and then a number of them are these more recovery type stocks, whether it's a General Electric, the Japanese trading houses, uh, or some of those e-commerce stocks like Shopify and Amazon, which have been through a period of trauma either over the last two or three years, or in General Electric's case, many, many years, or if you could argue with the Japanese trading stocks over the last 20, 30 years, they've been slowly moving from a position of, of sort of casual inefficiency to much more focus on what they're good at. So um, as we sit here today, we've said goodbye to a range of stocks for a range of reasons, reasons in a number of places, and we've brought in about 10 stocks. Again, very specific reasons. As I said at the beginning, there's no obvious theme to them, but I think that's partly a function of the kind of markets we're currently in. And I've uh, the conversations we've had over the last two well, year or two have always, I think, had this sort of frustration from my part that we can there are no obvious themes evolving. And I think it's because we're in this volatile, messy world with lots of um, macro uncertainties that keep sort of whooshing in and whooshing out and then things happen. So from our point of view, um, we remain relentlessly focused on that on that key factor for us, which is trying to find companies that we believe will persistently surprise because our core belief is that you if if you can find companies which are beating analysts expectations over time those share prices will outperform so we keep coming back to that core belief in what we do well that's perfect thanks very much for your time and we look forward to keeping in touch and seeing you soon yeah thank you very much for your time nice to speak to you today